Good morning and welcome to City Talk, a weekly program we produce for the uh, radio audience. We do a podcast and it's a television program. And it's a way for us to communicate great things or, uh, that are going on in Waco and better uh, spread word that needs to get out there. I'm Larry Holsey, Director of Municipal Information for the City of Waco. And today, for the eighth time, I figured out that uh, the mayor has been with us, uh, Mayor Kyle Deaver. And uh, we're going to confuse things a little bit. I'm going to, since this is a very casual conversation, it's okay, Mayor. I'm going to call you Mayor. I know you're Kyle. Yeah. But we also have Kyle Citrano, who is the president of the uh, Waco Restaurant Association. Uh, and so you're going to be Kyle. You're going to be Mayor. And we also have Council Member Dylan Meek representing District 4. And it's okay. I'm going to depart from tr tradition as we're supposed to do as staff and call you Dylan. That's great. <laughs> Dylan is the, uh, first of all, the council representative for District 4. He also uh, is an investment, uh, uh, local investment and real estate investment person and does title work. He's working for a title company, too. So a lot of person. And you're an attorney, as is the mayor. I've never introduced right. you as an attorney. So yeah. right. I don't know whether that's a blight or not. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it depends on your perspective, well, for sure. Today, I thought we would talk a, a little more about the local economy and the impact, especially with the restaurants, with, with uh, Kyle. Uh, Citrano, uh, with George's too, which many times I frequent you and have been we doing the carry out and uh, always enjoy you and and obviously Sammy and the, the whole Citrano family does a lot of great restauranting in the town. Thank but you. Mayor, uh, you've talked on this program before about the collaborative groups that were set up. We, uh, you established four different groups, the Business and Individual Recovery with Jim Holmes and Sarah Roberts. So you do the strategic communication with Hector Sabido and Natalie Kalinsky, health response and co uh, coordination uh, with John John Kennard and Jackson Griggs, Dr. Jackson Griggs, uh, and social services and education with Andre Barefield and Susie uh, Prather March. Tell us a little bit about how you have put Dylan well, kind of over this. Well, sure. So um, I intentionally did not put Dylan on a, a strategic working group because I needed somebody to kind of coordinate that work and also help me with some other special projects that have come up during this uh, pandemic response. And uh, Dylan has just been as as expected, uh, outstanding in taking care of those responsibilities, and has been really good about the way that he's coordinated. I mean, he's not he's not over those groups, but he is he is coordinating those groups and getting that uh, communication back and forth between staff and uh, and the, and the working groups. And so, uh, I just appreciate everything you've done, Dylan, yeah, to to, uh, to get us help get us through this time. It's been an honor. Uh, I, I'm thankful for the work that the mayor has done to throw these groups together. And I think that in the midst of, um, you know, a, a pretty chaotic situation, certainly, you know, we've heard the word unprecedented a lot lately, and that's certainly the truth. This is a very unprecedented time. And in the midst of a lot of people wanting to help, a lot of people wanting to um, engage uh, in a, um, these working groups, I think provided some order to that chaos um, to, to, and also, shows our citizens and really truly is a proactive response. Um, Waco is not being reactive to what is happening to us in this community. Um, it is being proactive to make sure that our outcomes are best in the midst of a, a really challenging situation. And so I'm, I'm thankful that these working groups were formed and gelled. Um, and I think that as a result of that, we're gonna see um, a, a more strategic, proactive response to some pretty difficult situations that we've found ourselves in. We, and we were appreciative in the restaurant community. Uh, Jim Holmes reached out to us yep. and talked to us about, you know, what can they do for us to help stimulate that uh, that bounce back after all yep. this. And, and we were appreciative just to have a voice um, and uh, and try to put our input in there because, um, you know, we want to we want to see everybody survive after this yep. for sure. Well, I yeah. think one of the great things about it, and all the when you talk about working groups. The bottom line is the, the what happened. It worked. Right. Right. And Mary, as you've said on this program before, we started out this whole pandemic as one of the highest per capita. Talk. Say, yeah. Say that yeah, again. Yeah. Right. So um, we we when we when we put our uh, shelter in place, stay at home order in place, our county had one of the highest per capita rates of infection with COVID nineteen of any uh, of any large county, any county of uh, two hundred thousand or more in the state uh, and now we have one of the lowest and so our people our, our citizens um, have done such a great job our businesses have done a good job our pastors have done a good job uh, and you know of, of trying to help people understand why this is so important why why these social uh, 
physical distancing uh, measures are so important and, and staying at home unless you're unless you're doing one of these essential or now reopened uh, yeah. businesses. Um, back to the working groups for just a minute. I want to say two things about this, and I've, I've said it before, but Waco is a very collaborative community, and that collaboration uh, was built years ago and has continued to build through Education Alliance, through Prosper Waco. These groups are used to working together. Mm -hmm. And I think that gave us a huge advantage going into this, and we're grateful for past leadership that has built that, mm -hmm. that collaboration. Well and the other thing I want to say is that, you know, it's really important that people understand that the city is not taking credit for the great work That's that right. all these key partners were doing. Um, the thing that we did was we tried to pull them together and get them working together and working together and communicating together. Uh, I think we've had a much more uh, impactful response. And so I really do think our community needs to be patted on the back for doing such a great job. And we've got to continue to do a great job going forward because even though we're really low as a community in terms of, of uh, prevalence of the, of the COVID-19 disease, that can change in a matter of days if we don't continue to, to be, be uh, I think that's a very important like part of what we're communicating today right. compared to three uh, a couple of months ago now. Right. Uh, as we just said, what we have talked about, the working groups, the collaborative effort with the business community and everything else, it has worked. But from this point on, we need to know that what is being said today, what is being communicated, the, the messages are out there, need to continue to be driven in and worked so that we don't flare back up again and continue listen to the leadership, right. to the community leaders and responses. Yeah, so part of this is, you know, we're excited the businesses are being able to open back up now. I mean, we know how devastating this has been to, to our small businesses and large businesses too, but particularly to our small businesses here in Waco. And so we're really excited that they are able to open up at a limited occupancy right now. Um, and as long as everybody works with, within those guidelines and within those rules, we have a really good chance of moving forward. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're going to do that, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to do that, and part of that is dealing with the Restaurant Association because one of the main things that everybody's been waiting for is the reopening, uh, not having to do curbside pickup like right. many of us have done. Yeah. But now that we are able to do that, uh, Kyle Citrano is the president of the Waco Restaurant Association, which is part of the Texas Restaurant Association. Correct. Now, I remember back just about the time the mayor issued and the, this whole thing started escalating, uh, the Texas Restaurant Association came out with a restaurant of promise, a list of things that they were wanting to say, we can do this if, if, if we can stay open. Talk a little bit about that promise and some of the things that are now incorporated into the same operational things you're doing that's in conjunction with the governor's order. Well, you know, early on in the process, uh, we had actually just had our state board meetings uh, there towards the end of February. And even something like COVID was not something we were really talking too much about. It was mentioned here and there, but I don't think even it, the restaurant business was really prepared for uh, how impactful this was going to be. Um, but um, our new CEO uh, at the TRA just jumped on it immediately um, and has been incredible at communicating uh, with all restaurants across the state and especially our board, our board team. Uh, of how can we, you know, what can we do to make sure that we stay on top of this? How can we stay ahead of it? Um, and so they put together a task force to really come together and put stuff out there for legislation uh, for your local governments um, to help try to support the restaurants, try to keep us open uh, and try to do it as best as the guidelines will allow us to and letting them know that, you know, we've you know, we've been doing these for doing restaurants for a long time, and we've been following guidelines that are stricter than a lot of other people. Having the health department, having TABC, um, and so being able to have that and, and give that information of what we already are doing um, was important to us. And so, um, you know, once that once that information was sent on, uh, we pass that along to these two guys here, um, along with other people around town, and just to try and let them know that, you know, we're ready and willing to do the right things. Uh, we just would like for your help to, to try and keep us open as best we can. And I think we were all, you know, everything moved so fast. So when all this happened, we were surprised to be able, or we were surprised to be shut down for the restaurant part and to just do the to-go. But, um, you know, you look at the success that we've had and, and limiting the cases here and bringing that number down and um, I applaud them for for making the right decisions it's a tough call um, and nobody wants to see businesses suffer but at the same time uh, the suffering would have been a lot worse if we did nothing and so uh, I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm happy that we're able now to move forward in these processes and get open to 25%. I know it's been very hard, and restaurant business in Waco is very competitive. We have some great restaurants and food handlers, and you talk about the, the health districts involved with regulating and all that kind of thing. This has got to be devastating for some restaurants that are maybe financially were not as strong to begin with. Is this going to, do you know, and you don't have to name them, but uh, is this going to close permanently some restaurants in the Waco area? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, from the surveys and the research that the Restaurant Association has done, uh, you're looking, there was about 2% of restaurants that had permanently closed at the beginning of all this that just knew they weren't going to be able to handle this. Uh, you're looking at another 6 to 8% that could, were looking at probably permanently closing. Uh, that was at the end of April. Um, and uh, you just, restaurant industry is, is tough. It's low margin. Um, and it's highly competitive and a lot of people whatever they're making that's they're not they're not paying themselves whatever they make for the restaurant or what's left over is what they use for their family and so um, it's not like restaurants just have a giant nest egg or a, a safety net to go lay or to rely on um, even the big chains I mean you're seeing with bankruptcy coming out you're seeing with places close uh, you look like Logan's in old Chicago which have uh, I think Logan's was in bankruptcy already and they've decided to permanently close their places um, you know it's not just the little guys either the big guys are going to see a big problem and um, if they don't have cash flow that was the biggest worry for everybody was cash flow um, and if you didn't have a adequate cash flow to get you through this and that's what the uh, the idle loan was for for the PPP loan to help you out to continue that cash flow to keep your people being paid um, to try and get you through this um, it was just scary because none of us knew how long that was going to be and if you were going to be able to get it and I think only six and a half percent of restaurants were actually helped with the PPP loans and so um, it's it's tough Personnel is a huge part of your business, service, good service, uh, but also those are the jobs that are that had to be, a lot of them had to be laid off, unemployment, that type. Talk a little bit about how the Waco Restaurant Association is, and you personally even for that matter, have dealt with the layoff situation and trying to take care of your people and that whole, because people without jobs is what Absolutely. I mean, the restaurant industry is hospitality. It's all about taking care of people, and you need people to take care of people. Um, I think what we saw uh, by the end of April, $4.2 billion in the state of Texas was lost uh, and over 700,000 jobs in the restaurant industry. Uh, that's about 10% of all the state's jobs that were lost right there. And so um, it, was a, it, was a major, it was a major impact. And as far as the state and the area of Waco, I mean, we were among many of the other restaurants that furloughed staff. Um, that you know, when you don't have people coming into your restaurant, and you don't know. Uh, you had to cut back hours, so um, you know we let people uh, go get unemployment, try to do the things that we could. We reduced hours, paid people more for the people that were there to make up for the fact that they weren't be getting tips, um, and they wouldn't be having the same amount of hours. Um, and it's 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 devastating. And you know, a lot of these places, a lot of smaller mom and pops, you know, they just decided to close up altogether because. You know, they can't pay their staff. They didn't have the available funds or they were trying to stay open and they're just staying open with themselves. Mm -hmm. They're cooking, they're cleaning, they're doing all that. Um, you know, um, I, I talked to Corey over at Milo and he's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm cooking for four people right now. I'm, I'm working the kitchen and doing everything I can. Um, and that's just part of that cash flow to keep yourself relevant and, and hopefully uh, providing meals so people know that you're there and uh, available help. And I think that's the big thing, too, is restaurants wanted to be a part of that supply chain there. The, the grocery stores were telling us, please stay open. Please don't shut down because they were getting hammered and we really needed to be there to help them provide meals. Um, I think the number that was surprising to me was in the state of Texas, over 51% of meals on a daily basis are provided by restaurants. A lot of people don't cook or they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't know how to cook. And so uh, we, we feed people on a daily basis. When you talk about the supp supply chain, talk about the supply chain for the restaurants because you all have to get the raw materials. I know we've heard the reports about beef and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Talk about, how's that impacting your business? So we're just starting to see it now. Um, and it's really these next couple of weeks are going to be uh, pretty crazy, I think. Um, we've seen uh, production facilities drop 30 to 50 percent in their staff. Um, you're seeing uh, numbers go up. I mean, people know Georgia's for chicken fried steak. Um, we've been serving chicken fried steak for a long time. I've got a great relationship with Waco Custom Meats here who provides us with our chicken fried steaks. And uh, and we've seen it. We saw a drastic jump in our price for the first time in years um, because of that. And not their fault. It's just about a supply and it's about what they can bring in and what they can bring at the price. Um, you're seeing uh, you're seeing the hog market. You're seeing the poultry market. You're seeing pork. I mean, everything is, 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 is being impacted. It's just not one thing. 
Um, and so, you know, even TRA in an email yesterday was sending us to say, um, hang in there, uh, buy what you can. Um, and if you have to adjust menus, and I think you'll see that. I think you'll see a lot of restaurants having to adjust their menu going to a limited there. Um, we know brisket and barbecue places are about to get hit really hard. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not anything like we've ever seen before with the amount that's having to shut down and, and not knowing when the end is, in, is near. If you've just joined us, we're visiting with Kyle Satrano, who is the president of the Waco Restaurant Association, and of course with George's Two over on Hewitt Drive, a great place to eat. We're also visiting again with our mayor, Mayor Kyle Deaver, and our uh, District 4 Council Representative, uh, Dylan Meek. And we're talking about some of the things that are impacting locally. One of the things that uh, really impressed me uh, when I looked down the list of the things that uh, the Restaurant Association came up with, the promise, as it was, mm -hmm. a lot of creative things uh, about having disposable menus, uh, no condiments like salt and pepper, ketchup, that would be hand-touched and things like that on the menu. And then you also, before we went on the air, talked about the change in the cost on your carryout items compared to plates that you would want. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about some of those changes like that. I just, I think, you know, when you have, when you go to a restaurant, you kind of, you know, most guests just come in, they eat, they don't think about all the little things that go into it, but, um, you know, there's so many different touch points as well as stuff, but as far as to go, I mean, you know, right now when a, when food comes out of the window and we're preparing it, typically it comes on a plate, I can see everything, I get it on a tray and I take it out to the guests. Now, when you're doing these to-go items, it's coming in a box. The box is getting close, you're having to double check it numerous times to make sure that everything's right. You're having to label things. Uh, you're having to make sure that, you know, you get one shot on to-go. When you're in a restaurant, you mess something up, or you, have, you can replace it pretty quickly, but if they are 30 minutes away or 15 minutes away, it's a lot harder. And then the the box, it's a disposable, so it costs you money. The, the silverware that goes with it, it costs you money. All those little things are not typical of what you have at the restaurant where it just may be the napkin that you have because um, you're going to wash the silverware, you're going to wash the plate, you're going to wash the glass. Um, so all those added costs are things that I can't go and just say, okay, well, you're going to pay the same amount of food plus I'm going to charge you a dollar for it. No, I'm charging you the same amount and I'm just having to eat those costs. So not only is my business slower, but now I'm having more cost incurred on that same food. So um, it's just, it's, but it's part of it. You're just doing what you have to do to provide for the customer and, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's part of this challenge, and you know, we've been challenged with things in the past, and we'll, and this won't be the last thing we get challenged with. It's just about doing the right thing, and you know, as far as you said, the the promise, and you know, doing the to go or the to go menus, the paper menus, um, you know, not having a ketchup bottle on the table, and instead, you know, portioning it out or using portion PCs of those, um, just little things so that the customer doesn't have to worry about was that touched was that what was what was on that who used it before was it sanitized um it's just little things like that the tables look barren and it feels kind of strange it feels very empty um but that peace of mind for the customer is you know what we're looking for right now because they're taking their own risk by going out and coming in and you can't eat with a, a mask on you can't you can't you know do those things so people are having to expose themselves so we're wearing masks we're wearing gloves to make them feel a little bit more comfortable well you mentioned about the customers as well. Part of the restaurant's pledge also incorporated a part regarding the patron, what, the, what your customers should do to have a positive experience. Absolutely. And, and tell that because now that you're opening up, uh, I think it's helpful for us as, our, as the customers coming to your place or any other restaurant to know how we can make it a better, safer place ourselves and appreciate what you're doing. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, number one, I think, and it's maybe not in the pledge itself, but just be patient. I, I think all of us are having to adjust and all of us are having to make changes. My hostess is sitting outside of the restaurant now and stopping you before you come in. And we're trying to allow for our people to open the doors that are wearing gloves so that not everybody's touching it and we can continue to sanitize. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's making sure that the customer is self-checking themselves. So before they go out, have you have, did you have a fever that day? Have you been feeling the same symptoms that we're checking for on a daily basis with our employees through a health screening that TRA's provided? Um, you know, are you doing those things? Are you making yourself safe when you go out? And um, and when you do come in, please make sure that you're following the guidelines that we're putting out there for you. Um, and whether it's you know if we can only have six people sit at a table. Um, make sure that, you know, please follow that. Don't try to sneak in. Don't try to do different things. I mean, whatever the regulations that we're trying to provide for you, we're doing that for a safety safety point of view. Um, and uh, it's, it's not meant to be a nuisance. And so we just ask that you do those things for us, help us out, and we're going to do the best to take care of you. Bill, I want to shift over to you because I know you're – uh, heavily involved in the community, not only because you're a uh, council representative, but you served on a number of boards and a lot of community-involved uh, 
processes and things, and people come to you, and especially since you are a council member. Uh, and so how do you sense the, the business community locally is and how they're dealing with this and maybe some of the challenges that you're hearing and advice uh, that we can pass on through this program uh, to those who are out there uh, wanting that guidance and leadership? Sure, sure. So first, I, I just want to commend Kyle and everything he said, and I think that, um, you know, I, I just so appreciate, Kyle, your, your work at the uh, Restaurant Association and then just really – our restaurants in general. I mean, it's so encouraging to hear um, the proactive steps that uh, you're taking and that the uh, that our other restaurants are taking to really make sure that our um, community is kept safe. Um, and so I, I'm appreciative of that. And um, what's interesting about this uh, global pandemic, I think, is that um, we're we're this has impacted everybody. Um, it's hard to find someone who hasn't felt a financial impact from this. It's hard to find someone whose business operations have not been adjusted because of this. And so there is this almost camaraderie that unfortunately has come um, from a really difficult situation and just hearing um, the adjustments that Kyle just this m mentioned in terms of having paper menus and disposable silverware and the cost of that. It, it's interesting how those kind of shifts um, and pain points uh, translate to so many different industries. Um, and so I do think that um, I'm so encouraged um, by our business community taking this seriously and working hard to ensure that their employees and that um, their, the consumer or their uh, customer or clients are uh, well taken care of and um, kept safe. And I do think that our numbers in McLennan County in terms of um, active patients are reflective, our low numbers, our, our, our numbers are, are low that we referenced at the beginning of this program um, because people have been taking it seriously and really working hard to keep folks safe. Um, to answer your question specifically about um, wh what are people saying, you know, I think you talk to 10 different uh, businessmen or women, you, you get 10 different responses um, on the whole. Um, I think that, um, but, but, uh, um, what I would say, what seems to be a consistent threat is a, is a real commitment um, to try to innovate and work hard to keep um, their customers safe and also keep their business uh, afloat. And, um, and so, you know, when I think about Waco, even before this happened, I've always thought this is a resilient city and it's a city with a lot of grit. And I think that we're seeing that being demonstrated um, in our business community right now. It's way easier to make a change than to sit there and complain about it because everybody's going through the same problems. They're all having their own struggles. So it's just easier to say, what do we got to do to make it work, yep. make it right, and go forward? And I think everybody wants the same result. I think we all have finally known, we've learned, and identified what the situation is from the very get-go. We said the only way to protect me from getting it is protect myself. I have to look after number one, and everybody has to look at number one because there's no vaccine, there's no anything else, there's no cure. Uh, so, and to collectively, everybody's done that. And I've sensed a, a feeling of everybody getting along better and concern for not only myself as I'm in the grocery store or super, wherever it is, I'm finding that other people are doing the same thing and, sure. oh, excuse me, and, and they're, they're keeping their space. And I just think, I think you're right. Both, all of y'all are right. Yeah. Waco's just got a neat Good, the great spirit. love for one another. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We've, absolutely. We've, we've talked about a lot for restaurants. It's you, you never get a chance to just do like a reopen, and that's what this whole thing's been. It's felt like you're completely going back. This is our 10-year anniversary at Georgia's, too, and, you know, it's like you're getting to reopen your restaurant all over again, and you have the foresight of what you've done before and what you can do, and so what changes can you make to go forward? And not a lot of people get that opportunity to do a reboot or a refresh, and maybe not just from the business community, but also as a community standpoint and how you treat people and how you, you go about your day. You kind of get a reboot of, okay, what was I doing before? How was I living my life? How was I doing those things? Um, and maybe it's a little different now with uh, having to think about these things. Yep. On the practical level, really quick, I think that another thing that I've, I've heard from the business community you know, are, are some questions. And that is, uh, w what are the exact rules? What can we do? <laughs> um, and, uh, and then beyond that, also, like, are there resources available to me um, at the f federal level um, and, and at the local level? And so I think that I, I do want to um, commend uh, this department, our communications department, um, uh, Councilmember Sabito and Natalie Kalinsky, who have worked really hard to pull together stakeholders and communicators to make sure that that information is being properly and adequately um, disseminated in this community. Um, you know, our federal we all know that the federal government issued this 
unprecedented um, uh, SBA loan for small businesses that they could tap into. But how you apply for that loan is pretty tricky. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I, I just am thankful for our Chambers of Commerce. Um, I'm thankful for a Startup Waco and other um, business uh, nonprofit organizations who uh, have worked collaboratively with the city um, and the county to really disseminate information on how do we apply for these resources that are available to us. Um, uh, and uh, in addition to that, um, um, I'm thankful for our council uh, for setting aside a small uh, uh, business forgivable loan program um, with assigned uh, already ec uh, assigned economic development dollars as well as um, uh, federal HUD dollars. Um, to make sure that our business community um, does have available resources to meet immediate needs in this time. I um, mean, all of that information is available on our website uh, of covidwaco.com. Um, and if you do have direct questions, if, if anyone um, in the public has a direct question about how to access any of those resources, then um, we have a business hotline um, as well. So uh, we've tried our best to um, disseminate that information it's not perfect. I mean, in this process, I'll be the first to say that that the city's not perfect. It, it's hard to perfectly disseminate this information out, but we've worked really hard um, at the city level. And I, I have seen other nonprofit organizations, our chambers, for example, who've worked really hard to ensure that this information is made available um, so that those resources and that clarity on, on what can we do, what can't we do, when can we do it, um, is being um, uh, uh, broadcast out. And just to your point of what can, what should we do and what can we do, the Department of State Health uh, Services has, has a great uh, FAQ for lots of different kinds of businesses with guidance about how, how, what you should be doing. And so we'll get a link to that site on the COVID Waco site so that businesses can go there and, and see that. There's, there's something there for almost all businesses that are now allowed to open that, that will really be helpful. We've got a couple of minutes left, but I want to make sure we get a little bit of the government part of it. But before we do that, I want to make sure, uh, Dylan, being in the investment and the title business yourself, how do you see that part of the world being? Because a lot of people have investments involved in their, you know, their retirement programs, uh, a lot of uh, in the title business as far as the amount of home sales and things. Sure. So far, the reports that I saw, at least for the month of March, were not real bad, and so we're holding pretty good. How do you sense uh, that's happening in this community. Sure, I can say where we've been, and and um, it's harder to predict where we're going. Uh, I think <laughs> that if anyone has a crystal ball out there, uh, send it my way. But uh, because it's hard to see the future, um, but I think that in terms of where we've been in, in real estate transactions, um, I think the residential sales have taken a, a very small dip, but it's not a substantial one. And um, I think that um, in the commercial uh, the commercial sector. Um, there was a, a, a pause, but as recently as this week, I've seen, and, and, and with the commercial brokers that I've talked to, a real uptick in transactions. Um, so I, I believe that um, there's, for many, uh, for, for homes and, and many types of commercial assets or commercial properties, there was a, a kind of a pause on, on should we proceed, but I, I'm optimistic um, for, for a lot of those sectors, but again, the future is hard to predict. Well, I'm hoping with the sales tax revenues will start clicking now that the business are coming up here and whatever else. A little final statement, Mayor? Well, I just uh, I thank you all both, both for being here today. Uh, mm -hmm. Kyle, thank you for the great work you've done with the Restaurant yep. Association. And it's just one example of the great work that our business people are doing across, across our community. Um, I just urge everybody to continue to um, keep your physical distance from people that are not, out, not part of your household. Wear a face covering when you're in public, especially when you're in a, a crowded uh, environment. And um, we've got to keep doing these for the foreseeable future. This is not going away anytime soon. We're not going to have uh, immunity. We're not going to have a vaccine, you know, probably this year. So we're just going to have to live with this. And it's getting old, <laughs> but we're just going to have to live with it. And that, if we don't, we'll, we'll pay the price. Um, Mayor Kyle Deaver, along with... Uh, President of the Waco Restaurant Association, uh, Kyle Citrano, a double Kyle here, and Dylan Mee, who is our District 4 Council Representative and a local businessman that uh, has brought some great uh, information to all of us. And I hope this helps everybody understand that the Waco community has a resilience, as has been mentioned today. Uh, and I think we're going to make it through all this kind of stuff. And thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. We hope you'll join us again next week for more information about the City of Waco on City Talk.
This program is produced by the Municipal Information Department of the City of Waco and is provided as a public service by this station.